The Ghost and Mrs. Muir by R.A. Dick. Dramatized to radio by Barry Campbell. With Brian Pringle, Gemma Jones and Philip Bond. So the dragon departed in a huff. The giant decided to mend his ways, and the prince and the princess lived happily ever after. Oh, Mommy, that was a lovely story. <laughs> I thought it was silly. Well, yes. you're silly, Cyril. Silly head, silly eyes, silly nose, silly toes. I'm not silly. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> now, no, children, that'll do. Now, off you go to bed quickly. Oh. Aunt Eva's coming in to see me at any moment. I want you both in bed before she comes. Off you go. Good night, Mommy. <laughs> You will come and tuck us in as soon as Aunt Eva's gone, won't you? Yes, of course I will, Anna. You promise? <laughs> yes, I promise. Now off you go. Good night, Mummy. Shoo, shoo. Well now, Lucy dear, it's high time we had a serious little talk. Oh, Eva, must we? Yes, we must, Lucy. It's no good you're trying to put things off any longer. You must think about your future, dear. But I haven't put things off. I've already sold the house. Well, that was essential, if I may say so, my dear. Something had to be done to pay off poor dear Edwin's debts. But the question is, what are you going to do now? There are the children to consider. Oh, dear. Lucy, we all realise that poor dear Edwin's death was a bitter blow. But it's more than three months now since he passed over, and life must go on. Oh, but I... Oh, goodness. Are you all right, dear? You look a little pale. Perhaps a nice glass of my tonic. Poor little Lucy. Oh, why I'm won't sure you leave me alone? Sure what am I to do? I sometimes feel I didn't just marry Edwin, but his whole family. Poor little Lucy. I know. It's so simple. Why didn't I think of it before? I'll leave Wichester tomorrow without telling anyone. Why, of course, it's the only solution. Yes, miss. Where to, please? To the sea, please. Uh... The sea, miss? Yes, please. Um, Whitcliffe, miss? Yes, thank you. To Whitcliffe, that sounds just the place. Now, let me see. It was a house you required, wasn't it? Well, uh, Well, I... now, what have we on our books at present? Let's have a look, shall we? Now, then. Willow Cottage, secluded house, four bedrooms, three reception, rent £150 a year, yes. Beau Sejour, three bedrooms, kitchen, bathroom, large garden, two reception, all mod cons. Gull Cottage. Three beds, two reception, small garden, ideally situated, furnished, £25 a year. <laughs> no, that won't do. £25 a year for a furnished cottage? But that's absurd. That's only ten shillings a week. You're quite right. It is absurd. And furnished? It sounds ideal. Yes. Now, uh, I think that either Willow Cottage or Beau might suit you. I'll just get the keys and we'll... Uh... I should like to see Gull Cottage, Mr. Coon. Ah, uh, that wouldn't suit you at all, I'm afraid. We'll go to Beau first. But hmm? I want to see Gull Cottage. It sounds interesting. Well, I can't help thinking that there must be something very wrong with it to be on offer at that rent. Is it... The drains or something? No, it isn't the drains. The, um, the owner lives in South America, and he is anxious to let it and get it off his hands, but it's, uh, it's very isolated and not at all suitable. I see. Well, we'll go to Gull Cottage first, and if I don't like it, we'll look at the others. Very well. Well, pretty dingy, isn't it? This is the uh, drawing room. Hmm, I see... It's beautifully proportioned. Goodness, what an extraordinary portrait. Hmm? Over the mantelpiece. <laughs> it's a very bad painting. Those strawberry-coloured cheeks and that ridiculous wiry hair. Uh, that's <laughs> the uh, late owner of the property, Captain Daniel Gregg. I say, what a very nice view from this window. The eyes are good, but... Oh! What's the matter? Oh, oh, do you know, I almost thought that it winked at me. Oh, must oh. have been a trick of the light or something. <laughs> Well, now, the, uh, the kitchen is, is just next door. Oh, right. right come along. Yes, as you see, the kitchen also is uh, very dirty. Oh, but 
surely somebody's been here, and very recently. That table is fairly clean, and yes, this newspaper's only a week old. Uh, uh, yes. Well, you see, the, the charwoman comes in, uh, came in to do a bit of cleaning, and... But you've uh, just said how dirty the place is. Uh, yes, well, you see, she was um, <clears throat> she she was called away in a hurry to um, a sick friend or something. Anyway, she did return the key in the post, and I'm I... I'm beginning to think that you're right. There is something very odd about this house. Yes, well, then, uh, shall we be getting on? No point in seeing any more. Oh, but I think I'll just look upstairs now that I'm here. Oh, uh, very well. This way. Thank you. And that's all there is to see. This is the last of the bedrooms. Needs redecorating, you see. Dirt everywhere. <laughs> I told you it wouldn't suit you. But it does suit me. It's exactly the house I want. But I still think there's something very funny about it. And I mean to find out what it is. Good Lord! What is it? That enormous brass telescope. Now, who would want a telescope that size in a bedroom? The late Captain Gregg. <laughs> of course, of course. But it's odd. The whole house is filthy, and yet this telescope is gleaming. How extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Quick, come on. Come on. We must get out of here at once. Don't stand there. Run, quick. Come on. Oh, that's better. I'm, I'm sorry I shouted at you. I'm afraid I panicked. I thought there was something funny about the place. And I must say about your whole attitude this morning. That house is haunted, isn't it? I... Uh, yes. Are you all right? You're awfully pale. No, I, I'm all right, thank you. It's, it's that damned house. You know, the longest any tenant has ever stayed is 24 hours. I've written, I've cabled the owner, but he'll do nothing to help me. Really, if I weren't a married man with a family, I, I really think I'd set fire to that house one dark night. It's getting on my nerves. I dream about it at night. Blast Captain Daniel Gregg. Why, well, is he haunted? Was he murdered there? Uh, no, he committed suicide. Poor oh, man, he must have been very unhappy. Did that laugh sound unhappy? No, I must say it didn't. But if he wasn't unhappy, why did he commit suicide? To give as much trouble as possible to other people. Well, it's very selfish of him. It's so inconsistent. After all, if he wanted to be dead, why didn't he stay dead? Exactly. Surely there's something that can be done. How does one lay a ghost? I haven't the slightest idea. Anyway, I should just forget all about it if I were you. It's, it's not your problem. Oh, but it is. I think it's a beautiful cottage and I intend to live in it. You what? I intend to take it. But you can't. I... Well, I couldn't take the responsibility. A woman all alone there at night. <laughs> no. Why don't you let me have Gull Cottage on approval for one night? Oh, I know it's irregular. But, but, I... but then it's not a very normal house, is it? Don't you see? I could sleep there for one night and find out if there really is anything there that might frighten my children. I might even run Captain Greg to Earth. What the... If he really does haunt the place, I mean. Maybe, Mr. Coon, you should be ashamed of yourself. A grown man to believe in apparitions, ghosts, and all that nonsense. But all sorts of things make noises in houses. You should know that. The pipes gurgle, stairs creak, furniture creak. Ah, uh, you can't explain that laugh by creaking furniture. Well, it may have been the wind roaring down the chimney. Anyway, I'm not going to give up Gull Cottage so feebly. If you will forgive my saying so, you are without doubt the most obstinate woman that I've ever met. But you will let me stay there the night. Well... Only on one condition, that you get a friend, some reliable woman, to spend the night there with you. Thank you. I know just the person, my cook, Martha. She comes from Pimlico. There isn't a thing in the world that she's afraid of. So, unless you hear to the contrary, we shall take up residence for one night, the day after tomorrow. Well, it's all very nice, I dare say, Mum, but we could do with a lick of paint. Mm. Mind you don't go taking it on a repairing lease, though. My brother Bert, he took a pub on a repairing lease. First thing he knew, he was flooded out. He had to put on a new roof. Oh, I remember that, Martha. Thank you. Goodness, what a lot of parcels you seem to have brought. I've been wondering what's in them all the way here. Well, Mum, there's uh, me apron and carbolic and, and a scrubbing brush and three dusters <laughs> and a broom and... So we're only here for one night. Well, that's as may be, Mum, but we may as well be clean. And this place needs a doing and no mistake. <sighs> well... Hot water, that's what we need. Hot water and plenty of it. I'll just fill my bucket and get started. Uh, 
I suppose the water is laid on, Mum. Oh, yes, I rang Mr. Coombe. He promised to make sure that the water and the gas were both on. Oh, no, I've given him a lot to do, I'm afraid. Oh, well, they did say hard work never killed anybody, and I suppose it'll hurt him. Mum, uh, this gas don't work. Oh, but it should. Mr. Coombe assured me that it won't. Well, come on, see for yourself, Mum. Oh, dear. Well, that's that. No hot water. You better get a Beatrice sent up, Mum. We've got to have hot water. A Beatrice? Yeah, one of them small stoves. And, and mind, you'll need a tin of paraffin to fill it. Oh, Martha, I'm so glad you came. What would I do without you? Calls me his own great darling, says that I'm his pet. I feel his place within his soul, that ain't no cod you bet. He asks me if I love him, I says what I do not ask. I like you just for your whiskers, cause they tickle me and make me laugh. Thank you. Well, I must say, Martha, you've certainly been busy. This kitchen looks almost habitable now. You know, it's a nice little house, this one, Mum. I almost wish I was coming to look after well, you. I wish you were. The way things are, Martha, I shan't be able to afford any help, I'm afraid. Oh, how you'll manage, I just don't know. Well, Mum, I don't believe you've ever even boiled an egg in your life. <laughs> I don't know, Martha. They're not quite useless, you know. I've aired the bed, made them up and tidied up the bedroom. Oh, no offence, Mum. I was thinking about the cooking and all. Still, cooking's easy if you don't lose your head. If you don't mind me saying so, Mum, you look a bit tired. Oh, yes, I am a bit. I know what. I'm finished down here. Suppose you was to go back upstairs and get a bit of shut-eye while I pop some nice bacon and eggs in the pan and get the supper ready. Yes, thank you. I think I will. It's going to be an easy house to run, don't you think, Martha? Oh, I never saw an easier, Mum. Everything's so ship-shape and handy. Ship-shape? <laughs> I've never heard you use that word before. <laughs> it's the ozone, I dare say, Mum. Makes you think nautical. I wonder what he was like. Who, oh, Mum? Uh, Captain Gregg, the late owner. From his portrait, he doesn't look at all the sort of man who would take his own life. Now, now, Mum, you don't want to go start thinking morbid. If you do, the next thing we know, you'll be seeing things and imagining things. Or hearing things. Exactly. But, of course, I don't really believe in ghosts. Well, they always turn out to be the wind in the chimney or branches tapping on the window. Or that in the belfry. Hmm. <laughs> well, now, Mum, you pop along upstairs and have 40 winks. I'll call you when supper's ready. Yes. All right. That's it. Off you go. <laughs> Mum. Oh, who's there? I... Oh. Sorry if I startled you, Mum. I could have quite right thinking you might still be asleep. It's uh, nine o'clock, Mum. Supper's nearly ready. Nine o'clock already? You should have woken me. You all right, Mum? You look a bit queer. Oh, it's nothing. It's just that I'd had the most extraordinary dream. I dreamt that Captain Gregg was in this room. There, I told you you'd be imagining things. I did. But it was so vivid. I can almost see him now. He was taller than I'd imagined from the painting. He wasn't wearing his uniform. No, that's right. He was wearing a black suit. He came very close to where I was sitting and looked down at me. He smiled, I think. I think you need your supper. That's what I think. For a few seconds, he just stood there looking at me. Then he turned away and opened the window. The window? Martha, you didn't open it, did you? No, I didn't, Mum. You must have done that before you went to sleep. No, I didn't. In fact, I'm positive that I shut the window. Yes, I remember now. I did open it to air the room, and then when I came up here, I shut it again. That's right. The catch was stiff, and I squeezed my finger. Martha, if you didn't open it, and I remember closing it... Come along, Mum. You're getting morbid again. Oh, it's my own fault. I shouldn't have let you do so much. I'm as strong as an ox myself. I forget other people in Sabithi. I'm strong, too. It's just that because I'm small, I'm considered weak. I am strong. Well, you were quite right, Martha. I do feel better. That was quite delicious. Goodness, I'm tired. And here I've been sleeping all the afternoon, or most of it, while you've been working. 
Now, off you go up to bed, Martha. I'll bring you up a nice hot water bottle. Oh, but I... No, I insist. It'll do me good to look after you for a change. Now, off you go. Well, I must say, ready for my bed. Well, all right, then. Good night, Mum. Good night, Martha, and thank you. Oh, bother, there's no paraffin. Of course, it's been burning all day. Oh, dear, what a nuisance. I know, I'll try the gas. Perhaps it's come on. After all, we haven't tried it since this morning. Oh, dear. Why won't you light? Why, why? Because I don't choose that it should. <gasps> Who's there? I don't approve of gas. I hate the stuff blood. Who's there? Who is it? Where are you? It's only me, Greg. Greg? Not Captain Greg? The ghost? I see you're being selfish and hateful and unreasonable. I'm nothing of the kind. Yes, you are. If you wanted to live in this house, why didn't you live in it instead of killing yourself like a great coward and ruining things for everyone? I did not kill myself, damn it. I went to sleep in front of that wretched gas fire in my bedroom. I must have kicked the gas with my foot in my sleep. It was a stormy night, with a wind blowing half a gale from south or west, right into my windows, and the rain ruining the curtains. So, I shut the windows as any sensible man would, and the damn fools came in the morning and found me dead and brought it in as suicide. Because my confounded charwoman said I always lived and slept with my windows open, no matter what the weather. How the devil should she know? I never slept with her. Well, at least that proves that I'm not imagining all this. I could never have thought of that. Of course you couldn't. You're a nice-minded woman. Too nice-minded. Only half alive, in fact. I am not. I'm far more alive than you are. And I wish you'd go away and leave me alone. I want to fill my hot water bottle and go to sleep. Well, go to sleep. I'm not stopping you. Even though you have put all that frippery on my good bed. It's not frippery. It's the best linen. I couldn't sleep in anything but linen, so I brought my own. If you had taken the trouble to look in my linen press, you would have found it full of the finest Irish linen. As for only being able to sleep in linen sheets... I've never heard such balderdash. You slept well enough in my old armchair before supper. Oh, so it was you that opened the window and nearly froze me to death. The fresh air was good for you. And it merely made your nose a little red. It didn't. <laughs> What's the joke? It seems too ridiculous that I should be arguing with a ghost over a red nose. Before supper, I was terrified of you. We are always afraid of the unknown. I was never more afraid... Then once, when I took my ship into an unknown harbour without a pilot, I was more frightened then than that time when a sea cook tried to carve me up for Christmas dinner. You must have had a very exciting life. Why did you retire? I was getting old, by human standards. Short in sight and wind, slow in thought and movement. You have to be master of yourself before you can be master of the sea. And with a ship, there are too many lives at stake. So I went into dry dock of my own account and took my seafaring second hand through my telescope. Most of the ships of the world can't the channel out there. If you were going to stay, I'd, uh, I'd show them to you. But I am going to stay. No one stays in this house. I don't intend that they should. And you'd be surprised how easy it is to frighten people away. Lily-livered landlubbers. Ha! Did you open that window upstairs to frighten me away? No. I opened it because I didn't want another accident with that damn gas in my house. What you don't seem to understand is that this is no longer your house. It belongs to someone in South America. And that's another thing. Letting that little runk have my good house and money just because he's my next of kin. Damn it, I was going to make a will leaving Gull Cottage as a rest home for old sea captain. Well, it's too late now. And surely it's better for the house to be lived in and looked after than that it should degenerate into the pigsty it has become. I don't want anyone living in my house but men and sailors at that. But I want to live in it. It's in the right position for the children to go to school and the right rent for me to afford, and I'm going to live in you it. You are not going to live in it, madam. I'll not have my bedroom turned into a scented boudoir filled with frippery and falderols. But you're mean, mean, and dog in the manger altogether horrible. Stop that crying. 
Sorry, madam, don't cry, I say. There's one thing I can't stand, it's a woman crying. Well, light your damn gas and, and fill your blasted hot water bottle. I don't care. Only for God's sake, stop sniveling. I'm not snivelling. I'm just crying a little. Because I'm tired and very unhappy and have nowhere to live. Nonsense. There are thousands of empty houses in England merely waiting to be lived in. Oh, that sort of sentimental twaddle won't work with me. Look here. If I promise not to turn your bedroom into a scented boudoir, couldn't we come on trial for six months? Six months? Why, once you settle in for six days, I never get you out. Please. Please. Oh, oh, all right. Look, ring your brats, if you like, and uh, um, we'll, we'll try for a summer. And you'll go right away and leave us alone? No, I will not go away. Why should I? Because I couldn't possibly bring the children here if you stay. Well, quite apart from the fear they might feel of being haunted, think of the bad language they'd learn and the bad morals. Damn it, my language is most controlled, madam. And as for my morals, I can assure you that no woman has ever been the worse for knowing me. I've lived a man's life, and I'm not ashamed of it. But I've always tried to tell the truth and shame the devil. All the same, I should find you too difficult to explain to Cyril and Anna. Then don't tell them anything, and I shall keep out of their way. Oh, dear. I wonder. All the same, it is a lovely little cottage. I shall never find another house to suit me so well. Did you build it yourself? Yes, I did. That was very clever of you. My husband studied architecture for years, but he never made such a nice little house as this. Though I believe he was very good at post offices. What do you wear all that black crepe and stuff for when you really didn't care the straw for your husband? Oh, I did. I did. You needn't waste your time lying to me. In the state I'm in now, thoughts and words come out together, like the bass and treble of a piano piece. No, my dear, you were fond of your late husband, but you didn't love him. Oh, look, look out. That, that water's hot enough. Oh. Uh, can't you see the steam coming out of the spout? Oh. If you have it too hot, you, you'll score yourself. Uh, besides, you are wasting gas. Uh, damn it, madam, you must be practical. Yes. I suppose I must. And you ought to have a funnel. Get a funnel tomorrow. Yes, I will. Well, I don't know if it's the right thing to do to wish a ghost good night, but... If it is, I wish you a very good one. Stop a minute. There's something I want to say. Well, what is it? I have thought of a solution to all our problems. I like you. And you're quite right. The house would be better for being lived in. So you shall come and live in it. And if you promise to leave my bedroom as it is, I'll promise never to go into any other room in the house. <laughs> So your children need never know anything about me. Mm. Well, that's your problem solved. Now for mine. You will buy the house. But I haven't any money. You will buy the house with my money. I've got some gold hidden on the premises that no one knows about. You will take that and buy the house from my blasted next of kin. And you will make a will, leaving it as a home for old sea captains. Impossible. In the first place, it would be stealing if I took the money. And in the second, if you are keeping the best bedroom in the house, where should I sleep? In the best bedroom. <laughs> in heaven's name, why not? God bless my soul, madam. I haven't got a body, and after twelve years of having no body, I've no fleshly desires. Damn it. Surely you've read the scriptures. In heaven there is neither marrying nor giving in marriage. The trouble is that you are not in heaven. It's too difficult to explain now when you're only half awake. And indeed, I may never be able to explain it in earthly words. But for the present, you must take my word for it when I say I wouldn't dream of hurting a hair of your head. So... That's all settled. And we'll see about the money in the morning. Good night. But it isn't settled. Wait. Wait. Good night. But, oh, but... Uh, 
Oh, dear. What am I going to do? I don't care. I still feel like a thief, buying the cottage with that money from the cellar. It's not right. And what about your next of kin? Never mind about him. He's the last person I've left a place to. Anyway, he's got his money. And now you're nicely settled in. What more could you want? Oh, I don't know. And what about you always hanging about? Why are you still here? Why haunt when there isn't any reason for haunting? I said I'd stay here until my house was a home for seamen and I'm a man of my word. And you're not so much as a ship's boy. Oh, dear. I sometimes think I must be imagining all this. Now, how can one argue with a ghost? Perhaps I ought to see a psychoanalyst. Bosh! Don't you believe in psychoanalysis? It's a new science, and they're only experimenting. And unfortunately, they can only experiment with people. Neurotic guinea pigs and rabbits being unable to unburden their subconscious in language intelligible to men. It's rather out of my province. I thought you would know everything about everything in your present state. Tell me about it. What is the next world really like? No, it's, uh, it's too difficult. It's as if I was being asked to explain navigation to a child sailing a duck in its bath. Uh, talking of children, what do you think of my two? Anna's a pet. I'm not so sure about Cyril, though. Oh. And by the way, I have a bone to pick with you. Why did you get rid of my good suite of furniture? I paid good money for that suite. I'm sure you did. But my father paid better for the chairs I've put in its place. And I got two pounds ten shillings for yours at a second-hand dealer's, which, by the way, paid for the new mantelpiece. Robbery. Nothing but robbery. And who wanted a new mantelpiece, anyway? I brought that bit of marble from Italy. And what have you done with it? Made it into a rockery in the back garden. A rockery. Oh, my God. I believe you brought up your own father's tombstone and used that for a, a rockery. I certainly should if it were made of black marble carved with gargoyles. Notre Dame is covered with gargoyles. Perhaps, but I shan't have to sit and warm my feet under Notre Dame. And... I don't see why you had to bring my portrait up here. You ought to be pleased I didn't put it in the attic. It's a very good portrait. It's a frightful portrait. Why? What's wrong with it? Well, the hands are terrible. They weren't my hands. I took the fellow who painted it out to South America, and he made that portrait instead of paying me his passage money. Of course, I couldn't always be sitting for him and wasting my time, so he just painted bits of anyone who came along. <laughs> But, you know, chuck the thing away or put in your precious rockery. And that's another thing. My monkey puzzle tree. I planted that with my own hands. Why? Because, damn it, I've always wanted a monkey puzzle tree in my front garden. But why? It's not useful. Certainly not ornamental. Think how much prettier a bed of roses will look. Ah! And you must admit that the whole house is looking nicer now. And it's much better for being lived in. Well, oh, perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> this fine really it gets everywhere. <sighs> Children, Cyril, Anna, come along. It's time for lunch. Come on, Anna, at once. I told you, Mother. I told Anna. Yes, Cyril, dear, I heard you. Did the postman come? Yes. Yeah, he did. Hello, Maury. I had such a lovely game on the beach, and I bought you some shells. Oh, thank you, darling. Oh, I'm hungry. What's for lunch? Salad and cream cheese and brown bread and butter. For lunch? I've got a letter. Who's it from? I think it's from Aunt Eva. Oh, golly, what does she want? Aren't you going to open it? No, not now. Let's go indoors and eat. I'll open it later. Come along, both of you. <sighs> You're all looking glum tonight. What's the matter? Something wrong with the children. Oh, you startled me. No, it's this letter from my sister-in-law, Eva. She's coming to stay. Right, and put her off. Oh, you don't know, Eva. If she says she's coming, she's coming. She's arriving tomorrow by the 5.45. You see, she hasn't left me time to write and put her off. You should have sent a telegram and said you had smallpox. Oh, that would be useless. She'd come and nurse me. Nothing would put Eva off once she's made up her mind. Oh, dear, she'll ruin everything. 
We've been so happy here these past few months. Leave her to me, my dear. Leave her to me. No. You must promise me you'll never speak to her. You must promise me. I'll do no such thing. Oh, dear. What am I to do? You do nothing. <laughs> you leave the doing to me. Of course, what you ought to do, Lucy, is get a few hens. You've plenty of room and you could sell the eggs. But I don't know anything about hens, Eva. I hope you could learn, my dear, you could learn. It seems to me, Lucy, you've rather let yourself go since you've been living here. You never go out. You don't belong to any societies, not even the Mother's Union. Of course, it's only right that you should observe a period of mourning for dear Edwin, but... Really, Lucy, there is a happy medium, even as far as mourning is concerned. My dear, if you go on like this, people will begin to think you odd, and then the children will suffer. Believe me, I know, there's no greater handicap for a child than coming from an odd home. <laughs> I no, my dear, you must get out and about. It doesn't help the children if you cut yourself off from other people. No, I suppose it doesn't. I didn't think. Mm. Poor Lucy. Thinking never was one of your strong points, was it? And another thing. Why on earth do you have that ridiculous great telescope in your bedroom? I, um, uh, I like to look at the stars. You never looked at the stars in Whitchester, dear. I should leave that sort of thing to astrologers. Well, you may go very odd indeed. And uh, Lucy, dear... Do you really think it quite nice to have such a large portrait of a strange man in your bedroom? Wouldn't it be better to have an enlargement made of that excellent cabinet photograph of dear Edwin? Yes, I suppose it would. There, 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 my dear. You must pull yourself together. You must buck up. Edwin wouldn't like to see you giving way like this now, would he? I see that my place is here for the present. Now, now, don't thank me. I've always known my duty and never shirked it. But if you don't mind, my dear, I'll have my divan moved out of the dining room and into Anna's room. I never did like the idea of sleeping where one eats. Yes, I suppose you're right. But, Mummy, she snores and she makes the room smell of toothpaste and, and cold cream and she asks me arithmetic problems when I'm dressing. Oh, it isn't fair, Mummy. Why did she have to come? We were so happy without her. Oh, dear. Well, I must say, we've had a splendid walk this morning, haven't we, Cyril? Oh, yes, Aunt Eva. And what a lot of specimens Cyril has. Oh, yes. Come along, Anna, and I'll show you what we found. Come oh, on. very well. Ah, oh, he's so keen. I do like keenness. That's where you fail, Lucy. You're not keen. I am about my own things. But I prefer growing things to taking life. Taking life? <laughs> you talk as if we were murderers. Well, aren't you? Lucy, whatever has come over you? You were never like this in Whitchester. What's that thing to say to your own sister-in-law? Oh, just because Cyril and I collect a few flowers and insects and butterflies. <laughs> I can see I must start you on some knitting. Knitting is wonderful for the nerves. And I think you should have a tonic. You aren't yourself. I wrote to Helen yesterday about you. Dear little Lucy is not at all herself, I said. And I shall stay until she is. I can't bear it. I can't bear it. And as for you, Captain Greg, you're no help at all. You said I was to leave Eva to you and you haven't been near me for a week. If you remember our last conversation, you implored me not to come near you till that woman had gone away. You said you'd do no such thing. Perverse little creature, aren't you? Well, if you'll ask me nicely, perhaps I might help after all. What will you do? Never you mind, that's my business. Well, you must tell me. You must. Lucy? Lucy, dear, are you all right? At last. And here... <laughs> uh, yes, come in, won't you, Eva? I thought I heard you cry out, Lucy. What's the matter? Did you? You, you must have been having a nightmare. No, I wasn't asleep. But I distinctly heard you. You cried out. You must tell me. Oh, it must have been your imagination. Voices, you know, like Joan of Arc. My dear child, what an idea. I assure you that my imagination is completely under control. 
voices indeed. <sighs> really, Lucy, I'm getting quite worried about you. You must get away from here. Go on a cruise. A cruise? Yes. Lots of people go on them. Going on any blasted cruise? I won't. Oh, my dear Lucy, how can you possibly tell whether you'd enjoy it or not until you've been on it? Well, I'm only trying to help you, dear. It's very good of you, Eva, but I don't need any help. I am perfectly well and happy here. All I want is to be left alone to live my life as I wish and not as other people think best for themselves. And put that in your pipe and smoke it, madam. Really, Lucy, I can't think what's happened to you lately. You used to be such a sweet little thing. Lady Smythe always used to say to me, I'm so fond of your sister-in-law. She's such a sweet little thing. Well, I doubt if you say that now. what Lady Smythe thinks. Go on, Lucy, tell her that. I really don't mind very much what Lady Smythe think thinks about me. I... Don't mind what anyone says about me, because most gossip is only the evil in people's own minds coming to the surface. Are you accusing me of having an evil mind? Isn't that typical of any woman, reducing everything to the personal? Well, Lucy? Uh, she is beginning to bore me. Let's get rid of because her. Because if you are, dear, you have only to say so plainly. After all I've done... Oh. oh! What a draft! Oh. oh, where can it be coming from? Oh, I'm chilled to the bone. It's me, madam. I wish it was a cyclone. Oh, I see nothing to laugh at, Lucy. I, I'm being frozen to death. I'm not laughing at you. What are you laughing at, then? Oh, just as I thought. Hysteria. I shall take you to see a doctor. First thing in the morning. Good night. <laughs> Oh, that's settled her. Oh, dear. Don't overdo it. I don't want her bedridden. And that's all the thanks I get for the trouble I've taken. But don't you worry, my dear. I'll have her out of here in the turn of a screw. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you must be mad to stay in this exposed house for the winter. <laughs> Oh, I ache in every joint. I'm never ill at home. Oh, really, I think these are two of the most miserable weeks I've ever spent anywhere. Well, tomorrow I'm going home. Yes, home. And what's more, Lucy, you'll have to go down on your bended knees if you ever want me to visit you again. And if you all die of pneumonia this winter, don't blame me. But this house suits me very well. We're all very healthy here. Oh, well, wait. Just wait. In the meantime, I'll be making inquiries about inexpensive flats in Whitchester. Not for me. Yes, just as you like. No, I've lived as Edwin liked, and his mother liked, and as you liked. Now, at last, I'm going to be myself. In spite of your poor children's health and happiness? Because of it. I want them to grow up with a true sense of values. And we really are quite healthy here and happy when we are alone. I see. When you are alone. Well, I can take a hint better than most people. You want me to go, don't you? Well, don't deny it. You want to be rid of me. Your own husband's sister. Oh, you needn't deny it. I'm not denying it. Well. I'm sorry, but it's true. You can't live other people's lives for them. Go home and live your own life, Eva. Oh, don't worry. I'll go. I'll most certainly go. And by the first train in the morning. Oh, dear. I wish I didn't feel so unkind. Why do you feel unkind? Oh, it's you. Well, Eva means so well. Poor Eva. Now, Lucy, don't be sentimental. You didn't think poor Eva when she was here just now. I'm afraid Cyril will miss her. Oh, if she had stayed much longer, she'd have turned Cyril into a, a spoiled little prig and Anna into a revolutionary. Cyril is a rotten little prig by nature, but so far, thank God, he's not spoiled. Please remember that Cyril is my son. Oh, no, he's not. He's Edwin's son, not yours. Cyril bores you, and you know it. You may love him. Oh, mothers are peculiar. But you don't like him. Not as you like Anna. But look here. You're looking worn out. It's that wretched evil woman. If I were you, I would hop into bed, tuck yourself up now like a good girl. How can I tuck myself up? I'm not undressed yet. Well, get undressed. It won't worry me. I was thinking of myself. 
Will you please go away? There's no need for me to go. Clothes, all the lack of them, mean nothing to me. Well, are you st still there? Oh, dear. He's right. I am tired. Your pretty shoulders and a damn fine figure. Oh, I thought you'd gone. You wear the wrong sort of clothes. No one would ever guess that you had such a figure under all that drapery. Now, 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 there's no need to blush. That's hateful. Go away at once. Now, now, Lucy. Will you go? Damn it, no. But I'll turn what you would call my back. Oh, very well. I'm sorry I was cross. It's all this business with Eva, I suppose. Oh, Lucy, you are so little and so lovely. What do you miss, Lucy, by being born too late to travel the seven seas with me? And what I've missed, too. How old are you now? There's no old or young for us. There's just being. Only immortality and eternity and vision. Sounds frightening. Rather dull. Alas, I've, I've no words to make you understand. It's all the beauty and serenity and ability you've ever experienced on Earth. It's all your grandest and most gentle. Cleared everything up. I've made a will leaving the house to your old sea captains. Don't you trust me? Not altogether. You are so young. Young? I'm 34. In years, perhaps. In experience, you're about 17. <laughs> and you don't look much more when you're playing with Anna and that ridiculous dog of hers. Suppose you were to marry again. Oh, I wouldn't think of marrying again. Someone might think of marrying you, though. You really are very pretty. And you are also extremely susceptible. I'm not. How do you know? How many have you met? Since you were widowed. Mr. Coombe? A codfish with a conscience. Dr. Hamer? Married to his profession with a wife and four children. The vicar and the curate. One a celibate and the other an adenoidal non-entity. Oh, don't be so critical. Were you so handsome? I may not have been handsome, but I could make my presence felt. Why, I could have twisted you around my little finger. You couldn't, and neither could anyone else. What do you bet? I don't bet. Well, I do. My greatest weakness was a good gamble. I'll lay your roses to a new monkey puzzle tree that you'd fall for the first attractive man who showed interest in you. Really? <laughs> you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Damn it. Even a ghost must have his fun. And I give up a good deal of peace one way or another just to hang about down here keeping an eye on you and helping you out. I don't need any help, thank you. I can manage quite well alone, and I am to be trusted completely. And now, if you don't mind, I should very much like to go to sleep. I've got Eva to see off in the morning, and the children have to be sent to school, so I've quite enough to be going on with without your nonsense. Marry again, indeed. We'll see. We'll see. Tags! Tags! Oh, do come back! Tags! Come away! Oh, no. Tags? 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 Where are you? Tags? Hang on, I'm coming. Don't do anything. It's Tags, my dog. He's buried. No, 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 no. Not to oh. worry. I'll, I'll soon have him out. Oh. Now, he's Tags. coming. Stand oh. back. Oh. Oh. There we are. Oh, there we are, old chap. We'll soon be back to normal. Oh. I say, uh, are you all right? You look a bit pale. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm all right. I'm just the shock. Knowing poor Tags was buried in there, not being able to help him. <laughs> it was a man's job, and I'm very glad that I was near enough to be the man. It was rather strange, really. I was on my way to my cottage down there, and something suddenly made me change my mind and come up here. <laughs> it was odd. Almost as if a voice spoke to me. A voice? I, I, I don't mean a human voice. No, I'm afraid you didn't. Afraid? Why afraid? Oh, you, you needn't be alarmed. I'm not one of those psychic people who hears voices. 
but I must confess this did sound oddly like a man speaking. Go back to the top of the cliff, it said. It gave me quite a shock. Was that all the voice said? Yes. A lot, wasn't it? Now, are you quite sure you're all right? Yes, thank you. It looks as though there's going to be quite a shower. I know you'd, you'd better come down to my cottage and wait till it's over. Here comes the rain. Come on, we'd better make a dash for it. It's only down the slope. Uh, come on, quickly. Oh. There we are, safe and dry. All right? Yes, fine. I never knew there was a cottage here. No, it's well concealed. Sometimes I like privacy, even at the risk of primitiveness. The water has to be carried a mile every day, and I have to bathe in the sea, but it, it suits me at present. Well, now, I think a cup of tea might fill the bill. Oh, thank you. There. Won't be long. Oh, lovely. Do you do everything for yourself, yes? Yeah? Oh, a woman comes in every day to clear up. Otherwise, I manage very well. Have you been here long? About a week. I saw it advertised in a paper. It's so peaceful. <laughs> Most women would say it was so lonely. I love loneliness. Oh, have you tried it? Oh, yes. I'm alone most of the time while the children are at school. Children? Yes, two, a boy and a girl. I'm a widow. Oh. You, you look too young to be a widow. Oh, there are many widows younger than I am. Oh, I, I don't refer to years as much as experience. You haven't even a married look. Is there one? Definitely. Like a well-set jelly. And don't I look well-set? You don't look set at all. That sounds very untidy and wobbly. <laughs> You're very sweet. I don't think you should say things like that. I don't even know your name. My name is Miles Blaine, and you are very sweet. Don't be absurd. I don't think you should speak to me like that. After all, I don't even know your name. My name is Mrs. Muir. Lucy Muir. It was strange how the rain came on, wasn't it? It was so fine when I left home. Oh, I ordered a rainstorm. The weather prophet is a friend of mine. Perhaps I ought to ask him to send a flood. Then you'll never leave me. <laughs> I think I'd better be going now. Oh, you can't go. It's much too wet. And besides, you haven't had your tea yet. No, I must go, really. You needn't be afraid of me, you know. I'm not. Then prove it by staying and drinking your tea. I'm so bored here. You'll save me from jumping over the cliff. If you're bored, why do you stay? God knows. I came here because I wanted peace and a chance to know myself. And the devil of it is, there seems so little to get to know, and I'm bored. What do you do when you're not here being bored? Oh, I, I live in London, and... Well, I ride a bit and play golf and squash and bridge. Have you no profession? I was more or less trained as a barrister, but the, the law courts depressed me. I gather that you don't have to work for a living. Uh, no. Well, then, why don't you work for someone else? If I could find someone worthwhile, I might. You could do so much good. How? Oh, where? Well, you could go and work in the slums or go into Parliament. Or... You're laughing at me. I'm not. I swear I'm not. You're doing me a lot of good. I feel a better man already. There, I knew it. You are laughing at me. I thought you were serious and really wanted advice. You know, I've never met anyone quite like you before. Oh, I'm very ordinary. Oh, no, you're not, my dear. Well, I must go. It seems to me that we've been talking a great deal of nonsense. But thank you for saving my dog and for your hospitality. I meant what I said. You know, I've... I've never met anyone quite like you. You make me think of spring and primroses and a new beginning to life. Yes, that's it. A new beginning. Well, goodbye and thank you. Come on, Tags. Come on. Goodbye. And thanks again. A new beginning. I wonder Time, my lonely heart is singing sweeter songs of love than the brown bird ever knew. Sweeter songs of love 
than the brown bird ever knew. Would that the song of my heart could go a winging, could go a winging to you, to you. That was lovely. <laughs> You know, you sing rather well, Miles. Thank you, sir, she said. <laughs> Happy? Mm, yes, very. I've never felt like this before. All these weeks, the meetings in the wood. Yes, Miles, very happy. You know, Lucy, you've become rather special to me. In fact, so special that I... I never want you to go, and why should you? In my small cottage, there's plenty of room for you. Come home with me, Lucy. Now. And stay with me always. You mean... I mean that I love you. Oh, Lucy. Come home with me now. And never leave me. But there wouldn't be room for the children. I wasn't thinking of the children. Just the two of us. But, uh, well, at, at first, that is. Later, perhaps, we, we could arrange something. That, then we could all be together. You and I and dear little Cyril and Cynthia. Cyril and Anna. Yes, of course. But, Lucy, my dear, you must think of yourself sometimes. You shouldn't always be worrying about the children. Sometimes I think you care more for them than you do for me. But I... I do love you. You know I do. You're very young. I don't think you really know much about love. Oh, I do now. And loving you like this makes me love everything and everyone much more. I want us all to be happy. And the children wouldn't be happy if I deserted them. Lucy, Lucy. I, of course, I could leave them behind on our honeymoon. But I'd have to make arrangements for them to be properly looked after until we came home. And need you be so sentimental and so practical? I hate practical people. They take all the magic out of life. But, Miles, I couldn't just abandon the children. You wouldn't want me to do that. Yes, I would. I want you to forget the existence of everyone but me. Lucy, if you really loved me, you'd come home with me now. But it's very obvious that you don't love me, so I'm wasting my time. Oh, Miles... I was so happy. Don't spoil everything. It's you who are spoiling things. Oh, you little silly. Don't you realize that no one else matters in the world but us two? What was that? Someone's there, <laughs> watching us. <laughs> it's a rabbit, only a rabbit. I can hear it now. Scuttling away to tell all the other rabbits that Mrs. Muir is behaving in a most depraved way in the green room. Oh, you are so upset. <laughs> but it's getting late. I must be getting back. You'll be here tomorrow? Yes. Well, God knows why I come. You're so hard-hearted. Hard-hearted? If you could just see my heart. What should I see? Perhaps I'll show you tomorrow. Lucy, Lucy, wake up. I must speak to you. Uh, what, what is it? It's me, Lucy, my dear. Oh, oh, I wondered where you'd got to. By the way, I owe you an apology. I am ridiculously susceptible and happier than I've ever been in my life. No, no. I believe you're jealous. Jealousy is a disease of the flesh. Oh, Lucy, Lucy, will you ever forgive me? Forgive you? Whatever for? I'm happier than I've oh, ever... Stop, stop. It was all my fault, don't you see? There he was that morning on the cliffs. And he seemed ideal for my purpose. But I never realized it would come to this. What do you mean? Lucy, the man is married. Miles? Married? I don't believe it. It's true. He has a wife and three children. But he told me he loved me today. He kissed you me. You must never see him again. Of course I shall see him. There must be some mistake. There's no mistake. I took a journey. 
and so his wife and three boys. Oh, Lucy, I'm sorry. I, I blame myself. I couldn't tell he was married till today when a letter came telling him that the baby was to be christened. Lucy, he's just a waster with enough money to indulge his fancies. You mean I'm just one of his fancies? I'm afraid so, my dear. Now you must never see him again. You must be strong, Lucy. I don't want to be strong. I just want to be with Miles. You're very quiet today, my love. Is something the matter? No, nothing. Silly, really. It's only a dream I had. <laughs> Tell me. I dreamt about you. I dreamt you were already married. Miles? Miles? No. Tell me it's not true. It is true. You've lied to me all this time. No, 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 no. I told no lies. It's, it's no lie that I love you. If you really love me, you would have told me the truth. Oh, but Lucy, you've made me feel a new man with a new life. Oh. Look, Lucy, I'll divorce Olivia. And then we can marry and go on being happy. She would always be there between us. Oh, don't be so Victorian, darling. After all, what is divorce nowadays? People get divorced every day. Uh, it isn't nearly as alarming as you seem to think. I'm thinking of your wife and how she would hate me. Oh, Olivia never hates anyone unless they're unkind to the children. She puts them first all the time. She even refused to come to Switzerland on holiday with me because of them. That's why I came down here... And met you. Oh, come on, Lucy. How can it be wrong if we make each other so happy? I don't know. I just don't know. I, I must have time to think. Will you come here tomorrow? <sighs> Say that you will. I must go. I must have time to think. Well, if you won't think of Olivia's children, Lucy, think of your own. Eva will look after them. That awful woman. What chance will they have with her? But must I always think of other people? Can't I have any happiness for myself? Would you really be happy in knowing that your children were unhappy? Knowing that his wife was unhappy, deserted? She doesn't understand him. Walder, Dash. The trouble is, she understands him a damn sight too well. She's a thoroughly nice woman with a nice sense of humour... And a sense of honour. Yet she neglects him for the children. She wouldn't go to Switzerland on holiday with him. No. Because she'd only just had the youngest baby. That's why she couldn't go. But that didn't stop Master Miles going off and enjoying himself with a red-headed wench of loose morals. But perhaps he hasn't told you about her. Miles wants to marry me. The sad thing about women is they believe so much of what a man tells them with his lips. I believe in Miles. He has never had a chance. Rubbish. I won't listen to you. I won't. I won't. I'm going to Miles. Tonight. Now. Lucy, come back. Don't be a fool, Lucy. Miles. Miles. Miles, I think you have to... what the hell? Oh, you, you'd better come in, Lucy. Uh... Good evening. Yeah, well, when I got back to the cottage, I found my cousin had motored <laughs> down from London. Really, Miles? Cousin? Why not sister? So much less suspicious. And after all, we do both have red hair. Oh, no, Lucy, don't go. I can explain. <laughs> Lucy, come back. Lucy! <laughs> Lucy! Nothing I can say would be adequate. All I ask you to do is try and forgive me, bloody fool that I am. I forgive you. I should probably have met him without your help, him or someone like him. No, no, if I hadn't sent him up the hill that morning, he would have left the following day. It was all my fault. I forgive you. But I can't forgive myself. I should have known better, because interfering on us in other people's lives is one of the greatest sins, and I knew it. It was my own pride. I thought you needed a lesson, and I am the one that shall be taught. I am indeed a, a poor representative of either world, and 
I shall go away until I've learned greater wisdom. Shall I go away, Lucy? Shall I? <laughs> What's the matter? Take that damn dog off my bed. Oh, you startled me. So, you've come back after all this time. Yes, ten years to the day. And high time, too. It's not healthy to have a flea-ridden dog sleeping on your bed. On my bed. He's not flea-ridden. What a thing to say about my best. Oh, girl. my God. What sort of talk is that for a sensible woman? I thought you liked dogs. So I do. Proper dogs, not furry frogs like that. <laughs> what happened to Tangs? He died, poor thing. Oh, oh, yes, so he did. I'm sorry. But really, it's an insult to call a thing like that a dog. Well, you obviously haven't changed much. Well, have you been learning a great deal in the other world? I'm not a very good pupil. I'm still too interested in mammon, as they say. Meaning me? Uh, meaning you and my house. I thought at any moment you might decide to leave it to those slum children you've been helping. You still don't trust me. Well, admit it, the idea did cross your mind. Yes, it did. It would seem a more natural world for me to make. And Cyril is growing up and may ask questions. He wants to go into the church. He's won a scholarship to theological college. I know, and Anna wants to be a ballet dancer. Well, she hasn't said so. No, but she soon will, now that she's left school. And then there will be ructions with Master Cyril. But why should there be? Cyril has never been the same since he won that scholarship and was taken up by the Bishop of Winchester. How do you know all this? Oh, I, I take an interest. Oh, yes, I, I've seen Miles. Oh. He's now stout and bald, and his taste in women gets younger. They laugh at him, take what he'll give them, and turn him down. Then he runs back to his wife. She's a better wife than I should have been. She's in love with him, that's why. Were you ever in love? Of course, often. But I never went so far as to marry one of them. Cyril says that celibacy is a fine idea. <laughs> you wait. The bishop's daughter has other ideas. He never told me about a daughter. Then he always was secretly... Madame Lijitsky was at the concert, and she said she'll take me. <gasps> take you, Anna? Take you where? Into our dancing school in London. She's on holiday at the hotel here, and she said she'd come and see me dance, and I never thought she would. And there she was, and she said she'll teach me. Oh, Mummy, I'm going to be a dancer. A dancer! A dancer! What's all this noise about, Mother? I'm going to be the most beautiful ballet dancer, Cyril. A dancer? Not on the stage. Well, of course on the stage. Why not? Mother, she can't. What will the bishop say? Oh, who cares what the bishop says? I do. Well, I don't. <laughs> to the old bishop. <laughs> it may not have occurred to you, but if you go on the stage, it may ruin my career. And what about my career? Well, the church would appear to me to be more important than the stage, and more Christian. <laughs> not your sort of church. Christianity has nothing to do with careers and gaiters and a mighty... Now, now, don't lose your tempers, both of you. We must all talk this over quietly. But, Mother, oh, make no, it seem quiet. quiet, both of you. We'll discuss this calmly. Now, Cyril, so what are your objections to Anna becoming a dancer? The bishop doesn't approve of the stage. Oh. And if he hears that my lady, she insists on being so selfish, she'll ruin everything for me. And what about your being selfish? I wanted to dance ever since I was a baby, and Cyril has wanted to be all sorts of things. And it's only since the bishop took him up that he's wanted to be a bishop. But there must be some solution. I know, I think I've got it. It's rather sad, really, but it might work. Anna, if you really do want to be a dancer, why not adopt a stage name? Oh, but Careful, Mummy, what Mother. I... If Anna changes her name, then there need be no further connection between us. Well, then, that's settled. Oh, Mummy. You mean that I can go to school in London? Well, we shall have to see, dear. I really should be going with her, you know. I don't like the idea of her being alone in London. Alone? You said you were going to arrange for it to stay with your old cook, Martha. Yes, I know, but all the same... Then stop worrying about it, then. Perhaps I'm being selfish, but I don't like London. 
And anyway, I couldn't afford to keep up the cottage and live in London as well. Damn it, the, there's no question of your giving up the cottage, is there? Of course you must live in it. I'm not so sure. Oh, money is such a worry. In the summer, of course, to paying guests. What? Strangers in my house? Never. I'll haunt them. You dare go bankrupt. Why can't your sister-in-law, Eva, help? I'd sooner die than ask her. And then you must make some money. But how? I'm no good at dressmaking or anything like that. Write a book. Oh, don't be absurd. I couldn't. But I can. Bless my soul. A bestseller. I'll dictate it, and you will write it down. Buy a typewriter and some paper first thing tomorrow. But what will it be about? Me. It shall be the story of my life. I shall call it Blood and Swash. We'll start tomorrow. <laughs> that moment, I chanced to look up, and there, bearing down upon us, was the biggest wave that I have ever seen. Coolly and calmly, I turned to the main Suddenly, I found myself all alone. My officers had all taken shelter behind the wheelhouse. Straining up to the drunken cook, I shouted, Give me that axe, Forster, you bloody swine! And at the same time, I gripped hold of a large piece of... Smiling seductively, the young woman, and the beautiful young woman, came slowly towards me. Then suddenly... She undid the fastenings of her flimsy robe, revealing as she did so... Stop! I can't put things like that down. Anyway, I don't believe they ever happened. And I will not write the Marseille bit. That we will leave out. We will not. We will. Then I won't go on. This is my story, damn it. I see no need for it. Well, I do. This book is going to be a true record and will show the black side as well as the white. I don't believe such things happen. Well, they do happen, and far worse. And they'll happen again to other young fellows in foreign ports, unless they are war. Well, if you'd read something in a book, would that have stopped you going to this... Uh, uh... Brothel! Don't mince words. I might at least have been on my guard. I wouldn't have thought I was being asked home to tea by a nice French girl. Was that what you really thought? Well, mm, yes. It was my first voyage, and I, I was only 16, and I'd spent all my life in a country village being brought up by a maiden aunt. Now, now where was I? Now, let me see. Ah, yes. Then suddenly, she undid the fastening of her flimsy robe. My dear mother, yes. what are you doing at this time of night? You woke me up. Why, I do believe you're writing a book. Uh, yes, I, I am, as a matter of fact. My dear little mother, whatever for? May I see? Uh, no, I, I, I mean, it's not finished yet. And I'm doing it to make some money. Now, go back to bed or you'll catch cold. It's quite warm in here. And very comfortable. Dear little mother, working away so hard to make some money for me. And for Anna. Oh, of course, and for Anna. But, uh, mother, you mustn't count too much on getting this book published. I mean, so many women are writing books nowadays. Not like this book. You know, I've often thought of writing a book myself. Perhaps we could uh, collaborate. I could supply the masculine element in your story. There is quite enough masculine element in it as it is, thank you. I believe you're writing for Peg's own paper or something like that. <laughs> Not exactly. I say, Mother, this is the most comfortable chair. Could I have it in my room? It just suits me. Could I have it, Mother? Certainly not, damn you. Oh, keep quiet. Don't you dare say another word. But it was only a suggestion. I'm sorry. I didn't realise that you were so fond of the chair. Anyway, I don't think I quite deserve to be shouted at like that. I'm sorry. But if you don't want me here, I shall go. Good night. And you know, you should get to bed as well. Don't overdo it. It's not worth it. 
And if you get sick, who will look after me? I won't get sick. Good night, dear. Good night, dear mother. He didn't hear you. Cyril didn't hear you. No. I'm sorry I broke my word, but he's not a child any longer. And he aggravated me. Take my chair, indeed. But he didn't hear you, and he's going to be a clergyman, looking into other people's souls. At the moment, he's thinking rather more of his own body, seeing it in purple in a bishop's mitre. He is very young and very ignorant. But he's quite right about one thing. You must go to bed. Otherwise, this damn book will never get finished. This is the place. See there on the wall? Tackett and Sprawl Publishers. In you go. But shouldn't I have written for an interview? No, just walk in. A surprise attack is often the best. I'll get the office boy out of the way. You just walk right in. Oh, dear. The things you make me do. Come in. Ah, do sit down, Miss Gordon. Uh, our readers quite like silver threads, but I'm not so sure... I am um, not Miss Gordon, Mr. Spool. Not Miss Gordon? No, I'm sorry. Well, then, who, not who are you? I've brought a manuscript... Oh, dear, so many people bring me manuscripts. How did you get in, anyway? The boy was... Uh, the boy was um, called away, I believe, so I just walked in. You always just walk into places? No, but I wanted you to look at my manuscript. <laughs> Your first book, I suppose, and you simply had to write it. Yes. All about love, I suppose? Oh, no, it's not. Oh, dear, perhaps I've made a mistake. I should never have uh, Oh, do sit down. There's no need to look so nervous. I shan't eat you, and I suppose that since you're here, I may as well have a look at your book. Oh, but uh, to tell you the truth, it was a friend. Ah, a friend wrote the book. Yes. I see. Well, now, let me have a look. Uh, hmm. Yes. I see. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, really. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Well, we haven't any lunch today. Lunch? Lunch? Why, what's the time? Two o'clock, sir. Two o'clock? It can't be. It is. What? Are you still here? Of course. Oh, sir. Uh, no, 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 no lunch. What, sir? Of course. Uh, I'm sorry. I will, madam. This is remarkable. A most remarkable book. I must say, at first, I thought you were just being temperamental and that you'd really written it yourself. But, of course, you couldn't have. It's a man's book. And what a man! Where is he now? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot you were here, but I really became quite absorbed in your book. Uh, which uh, doesn't mean, by the way, that we shall publish it. Uh, but uh, I should like to meet the author. I'm afraid that he wishes to remain anonymous. Nonsense. I I'm sorry, but you can't meet him. He's... Uh... I see. I'm sorry. You have my deepest sympathy. Oh, but you don't understand. Uh, and I'm afraid I can't explain. Oh, then, of course, I... Mustn't ask any more questions. Well, now, in the uh, event of our publishing, with whom shall I communicate? Oh, couldn't I just come and see you? It would be difficult to make out checks, uh, always supposing there were any checks, to Mrs. X. Couldn't you just pay me in notes? Uh, it would be highly irregular. Come, come, dear lady, you can trust me, you know. Your name uh, will be unknown to everyone but me, and your secret will be perfectly safe. I shall have to think it over. I'll come back in a week's time and let you know. He spoke as if he knew I had a secret. Did you hear him? I did. Oh, Lucy, you're so very young for all your years. What do you mean? Well, he obviously thought I was human and your lover. Oh, how could he? I'll never go back there. Never. How disgusting. An old woman like me. Old woman be damned. I'll never speak to him again. Oh, yes, you will. Perhaps he won't publish the book anyway. Oh, he'll publish it all right. And it'll be a bestseller. You mark my words. Well, I 
have to acknowledge it. <laughs> you were right once again, a bestseller indeed. I told you so. First edition sold out. We're a success, Lucy, my dear. Oh, how well everything has worked out, thanks to you. Anna, a dancer at Sadler's Wells. Cyril through Theological College and engaged to the bishop's daughter. I told you that girl had designs. So you did. <laughs> and you know I'm rather looking forward to the wedding. I enjoy weddings. I don't. But I suppose I'd better go. Don't you dare. You try and stop me. And besides, I want to hear what all those clergymen think of my book. You don't suppose they've read it, do you? You'd be surprised, my dear. You'd be surprised. A terrible book. A truly terrible book. What book is that, Bishop? Uh, um, Blood and Squash, Miss Muir. I really cannot imagine how any decent firm could bring themselves to publish it. I thought it rather good. Hmm? <laughs> there are some wonderful descriptions in it, and the moral outlook seemed to me to be rather signed. Pagan, I should have called it. Oh, definitely, Cyril. I couldn't agree with you more. Celia, I had no idea that you had read this dreadful book. Who wrote it? Does anyone know? Well, the author prefers to remain anonymous, and I'm not surprised. The book should be withdrawn from publication. In fact, I have written to the Times suggesting that it is. Yeah, I should have thought that a sure way to increase its sales. Hmm. I'm glad to see that at least one of our number has not read this book. Mrs. Muir, I notice, has ventured no criticism. Uh, her mother never reads anything but home chats. So she did start to write a book once herself. What became of your great work, Mother? Don't tease your mother, Cyril, dear. Haven't we all tried to put ourselves on paper? Yes, yes, they say every man has one book in him. I wrote mine when I was ten. Black Ben's Booty, it was called. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, I should rather like to meet the author of Blood and Swan. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine has it on the best authority that the author is a cripple. He lives in Soho and has never been to sea in his life. <laughs> I think I'm going to faint. Oh. How dared you? How dared you? I thought you promised not to come. But damn it, Lucy. Calling me a cripple who's never been to sea. It was all too much. It was too much to bear after all that other bunk. And if you'd seen them all battening onto the less savoury bits of that Marseille chapter in their own rooms, ah, all but the bishop who hasn't read the book at all, blasted hypocrites. Will you please go away? I don't trust you and I don't like you. In fact, I dislike you very much indeed, behaving like a whirlwind. <laughs> I wish you could have seen all their faces. I haven't had such a good laugh for years. And the butler... He spilled port all down his shirt front. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I, I put you to all the trouble of pretending to faint. Well, you had to do something. I was so embarrassed. All the same, it was a bit hard on poor Cyril having to lug you all the way up here. He was puffing like a grampus. Did I ever tell you of the weightlifter I once had as a passenger? I've heard all I want to hear about your past, thank you. And if you don't go away, I shall leave all the proceeds of the book and Gull Cottage to decayed gentlewomen. Damn it, I believe you would. All right, I'll go. I'll go. Mother, may we come in? Yes, please do. How are you feeling? Yeah, oh, I'm all right, thank you. But don't you think you'd better see a doctor? Cyril tells me he's never known you faint before. You gave us quite a fright. The bishop thinks it was an earth tremor. He's writing the Times about it. If you really are feeling better, may we have a little talk with you? Yes, of course, Celia. Now, please understand, we only want to do what's best for everyone. And we're going to put Gull Cottage in the hands of an agent right away. What? Cyril and I have made a little plan. We think it would be best if you were to come and live with us at Wichester. In the old home that Father built for us? <laughs> yes, it's been such a secret. Daddy heard that a curate was needed at St. Swithin's, you know, on the hill above your old home. And he asked me what I should like for a wedding present. On the day Cyril was appointed to St. Swithin's, we found that the house was for sale, and Daddy bought it for me. And now you are coming to live with us. Oh, but Cyril won't be a curate at St. Swithin's forever. I should say not. <laughs> But it will be lovely to feel that we have a settled home to come back to. With you in it. Always ready to take the children whenever we have a, a little jaunt abroad. I see. 
Well, it's very sweet of you, dears, but it won't do. Young people should have a home of their own. But it will be our home. It's kind of you, but no. But we want you to come. I like Gull Cottage, and I shall stay there. Mummy? Mummy, where are you? In here, dear. In my room. Why, you lazy thing, lying in bed on a lovely morning like this. <laughs> I'm a little tired after the wedding. Oh, yes. I want to hear all about the wedding. I'll bet Celia looked like a dream in satin. And Cyril looked like an old crow. Oh, thank goodness they didn't ask me. And what's all this about them wanting you to go and live with them? Oh, so you've heard about that? Yes, but you can't live with them. Besides, if you live with anyone, you'll live with Bill and me. Bill? Yes, Bill. His real name's Evelyn Peregrine Anthony Scaife. <laughs> so we call him Bill. And the ghastly thing is, he's a baronet. <laughs> Why ghastly? Oh, I don't want to be a lady. Oh, Mummy, if only you knew what a failure I feel. I see. You mean that Bill has asked you to marry him and settle down, and you feel it's a feeble end to your career as a dancer. Oh, Mummy, I knew you'd understand. But look here, you simply must come and live with us. No, darling, but I'm very glad for you and so thankful that you're going to settle down. But I have my own cottage, and I mean to live in it till the end of my days. With Captain Greg? What? Oh, I know all about him. The girls at school told me about his haunting this house and asked me if I ever saw him. And I used to invent stories and say I did. You never told me. No, I didn't want to frighten you. And when I was 11, I fell in love with his picture and used to pretend that he talked to me. Pretend? Yes. You remember that night when you went to meet that man? Anna. Oh, Mummy, I didn't spy on you. But you were so different that spring. And anyway... I was picking bluebells in the wood one day and saw him kiss you. And I went home at once and prayed that you wouldn't marry him. And then that night, when you went to him, I came into your bedroom and I felt Captain Greg was very near and telling me not to worry. <laughs> and I always thought Cyril the secretive one. Did you uh, ever hear Captain Greg's voice? <laughs> Good Lord, no. But I did feel he was my friend. Oh, I do so wish you weren't quite too alone, Mummy. I shall be quite all right. Well, then I have another idea. Old Martha wants to come and be my cook when I marry. But Bill has a cook married to his butler. Well, wouldn't it be far better if Martha came and cooked for you, and then I shouldn't worry about you? I think that's a very good idea. I really do. Thank you. You never told me how Anna felt about you. I don't tell you everything, Lucy. It wouldn't be fair. And she knew about Miles? Yes, she cried herself to sleep many nights over him. Why didn't you tell me? I thought I'd done enough interfering. <laughs> What's so funny? I just realised Cyril has gone off on his honeymoon on the proceeds of blood and swap. <laughs> so he has. <laughs> I should love to tell Anna about it. She'd laugh, so. Please yourself, but if you do, you'll soon become headline new. Yes, you're probably right. In any case, I doubt whether she'd believe me. Still, it is funny. <laughs> Poor pompous Cyril. <laughs> <laughs> up a bit for you. How do you feel today, my dear? Oh, I'm all right. I was thinking I might get up for a while later on. You do no such thing. After what the doctor said, stay in bed and lots of rest, he said. Oh, Martha, don't fuss. That's what I'm here for, to fuss, to look after you. That's just what I'm going to do. Now, don't you go frowning. Still, I must say, life is funny. Who'd ever have thought that I'd end up living here after all, looking after you? Still, it's a nice little house. I always did say so. Yes, you did. All those years ago. Funny how time flies. I still feel young, you know, Mum. <laughs> still don't know what I'll be when I grow up. <laughs> to think. The children with kids of their own. Miss Anna a lady and her husband in Parliament and young Master Cyril a canon. They've done well and no mistake. A credit to you. That's what oh, they are. Do stop. Chattering, Martha. 
You sure you're all right? You didn't have much lunch. Let me get you a glass of milk. Oh, do go away. How can I rest if you keep interrupting me? Well, just a drop of milk. Go Mom. away. Now, don't get in a state. I'm not Mom. in a state. I just want to be left alone. Stop boxing me, for goodness sake. Sorry. I never intended bossing. Call her back. Call her back at once. Oh, no, not you as well. I won't. She's such an interfering old thing. All her back. You can't leave her oh, like that. You great bully. Oh, very well. Martha! Martha! Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry I was cross. I'm not too well. I'm very sorry. Ah, <laughs> oh, there, there. I understand. <laughs> uh, perhaps I'd better send for the doctor. No, no, don't bother. Martha... Thank you for everything. Now, don't you start a thank you in, please, Mum. I can't abide it. You just get some rest, and later on I'll bring you up some milk. Yes, Mum. I'm so tired. Of course, of course you are, Mum. You just rest. So, so tired. So tired. And now, Lucy, you will never be tired again. No, I never shall. How wonderful. But who's that lying in the bed? That little old lady. Who is she? Look again, my dear. But I didn't feel like that. Old and tired and frail. It was only your earthly covering for which you've no more use. And now, my dear, we are together, as we were always meant to be. Yes. Come on, Lucy. Follow me. I feel so strange. And so happy. So happy. In The Ghost and Mrs. Muir by R.A. Dick... Dramatized for radio by Barry Campbell, the part of Mrs. Muir was played by Gemma Jones and Captain Gregg by Brian Pringle. Miles Blaine by Philip Bond, Martha, Diana Bishop, Eva, Eva Stewart, Anna, Emily Richard, Cyril, Peter Settlen, Celia, Madeleine Kem, the Bishop, Alan Dudley, Mr. Sproul, Sean Arnold, and Mr. Coombe, Stephen Thorne. The producer was Jane Graham.